That moves us to our discussion agenda. I think we have some special guests tonight. Sure. Um, our, on our discussion agenda, it, it is a request for traffic calming on Chadford Road. Uh, as seen in Exhibit J, and I will turn it over to Dr. Ross. All right. Thank you. And I just want to thank uh, Ms. Hauser and, our, uh, and uh, Mr. Glover for being online, and thank you for your, your support. At this time, we actually have three Irmo Council uh, folks in the, in the audience here, but two are to present on the uh, request for traffic calming on Chatford Road. Uh, so we have Councilman Eric Sickinger and, and uh, newly elected Councilman uh, Gabriel Penfield, uh, who are here uh, to discuss that request. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Uh, first of all, um, I didn't know my esteemed colleague, Dr. Barb, was going to be here today, uh, but um, good to have her here. Uh, so thank you, uh, Superintendent and board members uh, and esteemed audience members. Um, first of all, congratulations, of course, to the students who received recognition earlier and my appreciation to the sponsors, many of which are in Irmo. Uh, so I'm Eric Sickinger. I serve in the Irmo Town Council. And uh, one of the things that we've been working on in Irmo is uh, traffic calming and to improve the safety of walking, biking, and living on the roads in Irmo. Um, many of that, much of that work has been as I'm sure you can understand, long and involved, uh, but we've started to get some traction. So this item and this discussion today uh, revolves around H.E. Corley and Chadford Road. So for over 20 years, the residents who live on Chadford Road uh, have been uh, attacked by speeding vehicles. And I don't mean that literally, but uh, Every homeowner that I've spoken to that lives across from H.E. Corley has a story of a car speeding on their road and hitting their mailbox. In fact, I think almost every house had their mailbox taken out. Um, lost a boat, lost several cars, and uh, so it's time for something to change. And uh, the first thing I did was I went to Richland County and said, uh, which is in charge of that area of Chadford Road, and said, we need something. What can you do? And they said, we can do a, spe a study, ironically enough. Um, and so we waited for that study to come out, and it took about eight months. And after eight months, I called back, and they said, oh, we forgot, so it'll be another three months. And finally, when we got the study back, and they said, come on down to the offices, I was uh, anxious, but I was shocked. And that they not only, the study not only found that their number of speeders and the amount of speed over the speed limit was so high, uh, but that it meant they could approve speed humps uh, to go on Chadford Road, basically both sides of the entrance to H.E. Corley. So kind of as you're coming in to Friars Gate and as you're on your way out. And uh, that bored me because we don't have speed bumps in Irmo, we've never gotten anywhere close to this point. And uh, like everything else, there's a catch. And the catch was Richland County handed us a uh, clipboard and said, now get signatures from everyone that lives on this road. And I don't know if you can show them perhaps a page or two, but we got the signatures, as you can imagine. Um, it's different knocking on a door when you're not running for an election and you're not campaigning for something, but you're, you know, I'm not here to sell you something, but I'm here to give you something uh, with your permission. And so uh, one of those permissions that we need is from H.E. Corley, which is, of course, not an entity, um, and it's a school. And so uh, it would have been great if Dr. Kiel had just said, sure, you know, signed it for us. But he said, you know, bring it to the board. And I don't think there's anything too objectionable about this. I'm happy to answer questions, of course, if that's allowed. Uh, but um, it is coming at no, co no direct cost to the residents of the town of Irmo. Uh, the plan is once these signatures come in and delivered to Richland County, it'll be uh, the first thing they're going to do is resurface the road. So we'll have a nice street uh, there. Then they'll put down temporary speed humps and while they put out you know, RFPs and bids and uh, get it into work. So uh, that's the need and that's our request, is a sign off from the school board saying you support the safety of students walking to school uh, at H.E. Courtney. <laughs> Dr. 
That was a good soundbite. <laughs> and very, very, very accurate. Uh, do I have any questions for Mr. Sickinger, Mr. Satterfield? Yeah, I'd like to know, how did you come up with calming? The word calming. I really like that. And we have a lot of traffic in Chapin, so. Yeah. Um, I do, is that something you guys came up with yourself? No, I, like I can't take credit for that. Although, you know, I, I'd love to. So traffic calming is a field of um, civil engineering that really focuses and looks at uh, not just changing the speed limit, but doing other things to mitigate speed, both intentionally and uh, through social engineering, things like uh, narrower streets and stop signs and roundabouts. That's all traffic calming. Now, it won't mitigate traffic. So it won't help uh, Chapin and some of the other areas with the amount of traffic, but it will help with the speed of that traffic. Yeah. And one other question. I was just curious when I was looking over that proposal. How, how far down Chadford are you all trying to sure. calm? Yeah. Well, we want to calm the whole thing. Calm the whole but, thing. But uh, we would like to keep it calm in Irmo. You know, we're, we're getting there. Uh, but it is from Lord Howe which tees at the end of Chadford Road. It's the first right-hand turn after the school uh, to the end of Chadford at Farming Creek. And by the way, I was really happy that we were able to, I don't know if any of you are aware of that crossing at Lord Howe, but uh, I was very glad while I was there talking about the speed humps, I said, by the way, the crossing at Lord Howe and Chadford has been messed up for 10 years. Would you mind fixing it? And they did. So just a little extra perk of, you know. I was going to add one last yes, thing, and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of this, but I've had people tell me that when traffic gets really bad on 76, that they, the cut through is down North Royal Tower and then Chadford. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah so. it's, um, so one of the things that we did was we put a stop sign on Royal Tower so that people couldn't just drive with their eyes closed. And uh, we'll be putting another stop sign up on South Royal, I think it is, and Chadford, which is over by the new park. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of cut throughs and a lot of speeding that goes on there. Yeah. And in fact, while uh, Councilman Gabriel and I were on our way to collect signatures, uh, we drove by a guy who was looking at his mailbox and we both got out. And he said, yeah, my mailbox got taken out by someone speeding. And so I replaced it, and now it's been hit and taken out again. So we have some more work to go. Mr. Scully. Yeah, I just have two questions. Um, the first one is really for us. Procedurally, I'm a little confused. What are, what are we being asked to do? This is not an action item. You don't need our approval, or you do? So I think there does need to be board approval for this. Um, it was the first time discussing it, which is why it was put on the discussion agenda. My question also to Dr. Wright, Dr. Ross and I guess his team is, you know, what impact is that for us, for the school? I mean, is there like, one of the questions I was gonna ask was like, what kind of speed bump are we talking about? Is it like one of those ones that'll take off your fender, like that'll mess up school buses? Or is it like and the- That was the second the, question like, I was gonna ask. The, the, where it's, it feels like you're running off the road. Great point. It's <laughs> a, it's a, that, it's a gradual hump. So it's, it's one of okay. the, I think I suppose it depends on which way you're looking at it, but if you're going over it in your car, it is a extended uh, raised hump. Okay. And um, one of the other things, just to just to clarify, we did we did want to just have the principal sign, but <laughs> uh, it's but in terms of authority, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point, um, and it'll probably mean you know it'll have to be on the agenda as an approval. But. Right. Uh, and that Ross, was my, can you my, answer just the, real quickly? Can he answer that question though yeah. about what? It means for yeah, the we, district. Yeah, we, we, we support uh, okay. the, the uh, traffic calming in that area. We think it would be in line with uh, what we're doing. But we didn't want to present something for action uh, the first time you saw it. Okay. And related to, my question was about this, you know, what impact will it have on our district resources vehicles? Um, not that it's worth it, but it would just, as long as we know, will it in, increase or speed up the wear and tear of the buses and things like that? Uh, no, sir. I'm, I'm very familiar with these devices across the district and other locations, and uh, even the, the school bus is required to go through the, you know, the appropriate speed, and we monitor that on a day-to-day -day basis, but it would have no uh, impact on the, the wear and tear of the buses. Okay. Okay. Mr. Hogan? <clears throat> kind of a similar question to, to piggyback on Kevin's. 
would these calming devices slow the, the flow of traffic to where it would impact our bus loops or drop off pickup lines? Uh, is there uh, slow traffic, but I didn't hear the immediate thing after that. I apologize. Will it, will it impact the, the flow of our bus traffic or carpool line pickup drop off? I mean, I know like for instance, Chapin Intermediate is, is very difficult to get in and out of. I think a speed bump would throw a kink into that. I just want to make sure that this isn't going to impede any of that. I mean, I'm, I'm for it. I think it's a great yeah, idea. Sure. I want to know why we're not looking at spike strips. Right. Um, Can we throw them down? I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, I'm Gabriel Penfield. I'd just like to add in the information that we provided, there's a, um, a schematic of the speed hump. It's 14 feet wide. Okay. So it's not like one of these transmission droppers that you would hit immediately. It's a gradual. Okay, thing. perfect. And also want to add, we looked at the traffic study. There's 3,400 cars a day go through there. I call it the Friars Gate Bypass, so it would be helpful. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Do I have any more questions? Just real quick, you'll be cognizant of like the placement of where they are in terms of, I can imagine putting a bump coming out of a turn from the school that the school, so it doesn't, I don't want them too close to the school, it's close enough to where traffic slows down, but not to where it impacts or affects the turning of the bus coming out and sure. the balance. I know that's, that's a really good point. I, I think, and certainly I'll take all of that into advisement and make sure I bring it up with Richland County. But um, if you if you can think of where HE Corley is in the entry, uh, it is going to be between. Actually, we do have the for your for your records. Uh, it will be at um, 1601 and 1415 to 1419. I think those houses are right next to each other. So 1415, 1419, and then 1521 and 1601. And it effectively is uh, shortly after you turn on to Chadford from Lord Howe going towards the school and maybe, uh, and the first house on that section coming from, Fry from um, Farming Creek. All right, any more questions? Okay, so timeline-wise for you, um, what are you looking at? Because we didn't put it on our action sure. agenda. We have it on our discussion agenda. Yeah. Um, so typically we don't take motions on that. Um, That's fine. I'm, I'm okay I'm with gonna that. I'm not going to turn it down. But uh, what I will say is our next meeting is April 22nd. Is that... That's fine. Is that a t okay? Sure. Because I know that you're working with Richland County and... Yeah. Is, is that a know. single vote? Hmm? Uh, Madam Chair, is that a single vote? Yes, it's one okay. vote. Yes, Great. it would be. Yeah, it would just be one vote. It, we can put it on our action agenda for the next meeting um, if we don't have a motion because I don't. We don't have. You know, it's on our discussion. Yeah. I'm trying to follow the yeah, rules no, I here. I completely understand. <laughs> We're fine with that. Um, but I appreciate. Uh, I appreciate you coming and speaking. And if anybody, any board members, has any questions, I guess they can reach out to any of us. Any of you. Okay. Well, okay. thank you very much for coming to our meeting. <laughs> All right, that um, brings us to item 17 on our discussion agenda, which is the grading presentation, South Carolina Uniform Grading Policy Exhibit K, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Ross. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, um, members of the board and our community. Uh, right now, uh, coming to our podium is our Chief of Academics, Ms. Tina McCaskill, uh, to bring forward the, uh, our discussion of the uh, grading presentation. Just knowing that we're having this for discussion as we go through this, I would like to say this uh, originates uh, all the way back to uh, 2015. Uh, at that time, our accreditation report was by Advanced Ed at that time at Cognia. Uh, and so the question, why are we talking about grading? Well, uh, at that point, it was uh, discussed to have key competencies as a part of our grading system and a vertical and horizontal um, uh, uh, procedures for grading. So uh, this is something we've been dealing with for some time now. It is a, a very difficult uh, conversation. I just want to salute to Ms. McCaskill for taking this uh, on and um, there is no action tonight, just more discussion. So, Ms. McCaskill. Good evening again, Madam Chair, Board, Dr. Ross. Um, based on our conversation last time and lots of input that we've received from teachers and um, just administrators talking through this, 
you'll find that tonight's presentation has a lot of research base in it and tries to answer some of the questions that, that you all had as well as some questions that have come from, from some staff members as well. So let's start off with our philosophy. Um, you saw this last time, but I did want to make sure that I call attention to the highlighted part that the grades in School District 5 reflect evidence of student proficiency in the learning progression of content standards and skills over time. Behavior and effort are evaluated and reported separately from the academic grade. And you'll see where this came from in a timeline in just a few minutes. Or actually in just a second. All right, so when we look at grading, this is a, um, a quote that stands out to me. Although assigning high grades as rewards can sometimes motivate students, assigning low grades as punishment does not encourage students to do better. Furthermore, grades used as external incentives can sometimes lead to decreased motivation, diminished performance, addictive behaviors, or cheating. So when we look at that research and we think about what grades do to students, let's go ahead and keep going into what we want to do going forward. So looking at the timeline, just to make sure we're clear that this didn't come up out of the blue, I could have started back in 2015 with advanced ed, but this is the most recent conversation because in 2015 that conversation started and we actually, to give you a little background there, we actually did um, adopt some procedures for power school for minor and major grades for the number of days that grades should be submitted um, for parents to be able to see in power school. After that, we began a conversation um, around grading and at that time decided as a district not to move forward with any changes in the grading, but knowing that in order to meet the advanced ed suggestions, we needed to do something. But at that time, it just didn't seem to be the time to move forward with it then. So moving ahead, Last year, we talked with administrators, we talked with SICs, um, and we began looking at research articles about grading and began digging in and talking and giving presentations and giving the, the, the research to principals to then take back to their schools. March 1st, we had a joint PD, which is where the principal brings one additional person from their school with them for us to do additional um, PD and looking at research for grading, and that was where we started developing that grading philosophy that, that you saw. After that, we had um, grading presentations with our SICs and our faculties and staff, and that's where um, they gave input as to what they wanted for grades as far as what, what did grading mean, what did they want to see from their child, what did they want to see for, for students, and then in June of 23, we had administrators again with the summit where we had more about the grading timeline and the process. So at that point, administrators knew where we were moving forward with um, K-5 as well as 612. So then in June of 2023, we started the elementary rubric creation. A lot of our teachers have asked about rubrics and the time that it would take for them. Those rubrics have been created and they've actually been looking at those rubrics every month through the Leadership Tuesdays and the third Tuesdays and then the fourth Tuesday. The whole staff has been looking at that. Um, and then January, February, we had draft report cards that were given to Mr. Giuliano to begin getting input on. March of 2024, we had grading presentations at each school for teachers and SIC. We have um, a survey of additional needs at that point, like what types of questions do they have, what kinds of support do they need to move forward, and we're in the process of making an FAQ, which you'll see some of that, but it's very little of it tonight, but you'll, we're making an FAQ to, to take those questions and really make sure that we have answers to those questions for teachers so that they understand what they've already done and how that, they may not see it, that they're as far along as they really are. Um, then we're getting, last Thursday, I believe it was, we had FAC, and we got input from them, and I encouraged um, them to send me pros and cons from every school about what they heard from the grading practices. 
So far, I have heard from four schools um, and have been able to, to talk with them and give them some input about their questions and to show them where those things have been done and, and help them understand the research behind what's taking place. Um, excuse me. And then we'll continue in May and summer. We'll continue with professional development. We'll continue with support and making sure that everyone is clear on where we're, where we're, needing, where we're needing to go. Will it be perfect to begin with? Probably not. Grading's never perfect, to be quite honest. It's probably one of the messiest things that we do and one of the most important things that we do. So um, we'll continue to move forward from there. Um, okay, so here's an example for grading for learning. So I want you to pretend that you're going skydiving and that you're going to, you're signing your papers to go skydiving and you get to choose the person that's going to pack your parachute packer. So you get to look at this data. You see Abigail's data, Ben's data, and Charlie's data when they were being taught how to pack someone's parachute. So I wonder, which of these would you prefer to pack your parachute for you? Which of these three, Abigail, Ben, or Charlie? This is where you get to participate. I hear a Ben. I'm going to personally say I would prefer Abigail. And I'm just going to explain a little bit about that. So Abigail starts at the bottom. Her, her learning is, is fairly low. And then she continues to increase until she gets up to around, that's around 90 to 95% accuracy if you look at that. Ben, he knew it all. But by the time he graduated, he didn't know much. He was in the bottom. He continuously went down. Charlie, Charlie was one of these that it depends on the day and time how well he does. They all got the same report card grade. So whenever those three got a report card grade, they all got the same grade. But I wonder if we think about that, which one truly left their learning how to pack a parachute to be effective and efficient and to put my life in their hands? So that's what I wonder. And when we look at that, that's exactly what proficiency-based grading does for us. Um, and so why do we use proficiency-based grading? Proficiency-based grading supports learning by focusing on the concepts and skills that have or have not been learned, rather than focusing on losing points. So our goal here really is to help students, and, and I talked a little bit about effect sizes last time, but just to give, you, to give you a few numbers here and to talk a little bit about instructional strategies. When students set goals for themselves and self-assess themselves, Setting goals has what we call an effect size of 0.5. What that means is anything over 0.4 is more than a year's worth of growth. When they set their own, when they, when they can actually assess themselves because they know what it is that they're supposed to be learning and they can say, this is what I know a lot about and this is what I need help on, that effect size is 1.44. That's almost three years of growth from one instructional strategy. So what we're talking about with proficiency-based grading is that students will have I can statements that they can understand. I can add fractions. I can divide fractions. I can find the inverse of a number. And they can actually identify which of those things they can do and which of those things they cannot do. So they're self-assessing themselves. So that is where we want our elementary students to get, rather than focusing on, oh no, I have an 80, or oh no, I have a 90. 
and they don't even know what that means about their learning. If we can get them there by fifth grade, then hopefully moving into sixth grade, they're not going to focus as much on the number and more about the learning. So that's the point of that. I kind of went ahead and told the advantage as well, which is the second bullet. And then why should the grading system be changed? Research says that this is the way for a higher academic achievement, and that's what we're all about is the higher academic achievement. And last time you had some questions about transitioning from fifth to sixth, and so I wanted to make sure that that criteria is there for you. That we've actually, our Montessori students in fifth grade this year or have a proficiency-based report card already. And so this criteria is being used for those students at this time, for this year. And then considerations for retention, some, some of you asked about that as well. So like I said last time, elementary retention is very different than secondary retention, but I did just list some things here that we definitely would want to have as considerations for retention. We'd certainly want to think about the maturity of the student. We want to think about the socialization of the student. Are 50% or greater of the standards, or are they needs improvement? Has the child been previously retained? What are, what are the SC Ready correlations for the student from MAP? And then we have a student assistance team that meets and discusses. We have, you know, we have a school psychologist involved, we have parents involved, we have teachers involved, administrators involved to talk about what would be best for this child based on all of these considerations. So I wanted to make sure that you could see um, those pieces and parts as well. Oops, all right. So here is an example of a success criteria. And some of your input was taken into account as far as the letters um, for the report card. I know it's really tiny, but it's needs improvement. So the NI is needs improvement. The PR is progressing, and the M is met. So we did make a few adjustments there. Um, and then you'll see that the bullets that are on the left-hand or right-hand column, excuse me, um, where the red arrow is right now, those are what we call the I can statements and success criterias, where students and teachers know exactly what we need to know for the standard. So it breaks it down into specific skills for the um, for students to know and those are done for every standard for every subject by quarter so the parents will get a report that says first quarter your students going to need to know these things and they'll have that from the beginning they'll have it for second quarter third quarter fourth quarter for each of the four con core content subjects um, this is a report card example um, some questions have come up about whether or not we'll gray out areas that won't be um, scored that particular nine weeks based on our pacing and framework for the district, and that is being worked on. If it's not grayed out, there'll be specific asterisks that across the district, you know, in first grade, the same things will be scored for first grade in first quarter and so on. So I'm going to stop there and pause for a second because this is where secondary sort of begins. So are there any questions about the proficiency-based grading for elementary before I move forward into secondary? Mr. Scully. Yeah. Hey, Ms. McCaskill. Um, my question is, well, first of all, I, I, I'm in support of, of what you're proposing, and I understand that there's a large, I mean, there's a wide support among the teachers. Um, however, there's also concern about the implementation of this. And so I'm gonna read this. It's just kind of all things considered, given that you'll be getting um, new reading textbooks in elementary schools, new standards and some subjects next year. Will there, will there be time to calibrate the grading so that they can ensure students who are graded for example, as meets uh, standard at one school would get the same grade at another, or would it make more sense to ease our way into the system um, with just one or two subjects? What, how would you respond to that? What are the... Sure. So to go into it with one or two subjects, in my opinion, and, and just from what I've read, 
it's, it's very confusing. It would be confusing for students and parents to see some number grades versus some like proficiency-based grades. So I don't, that, that I don't feel is best, but what I do want teachers to understand is we are going to ease into this. So they've already been in just embedding themselves into the new ELA standards already. So we've had this full year that we have been looking at ELA standards, which are new for next year. So we have been embedding ourselves in those all year. So they have had some time, I still know they're new because they've still been teaching old standards. So I get it, we're in both worlds. But they have really ingrained themselves in that. Um, and throughout next year, we'll continue to do support for standards-based grading. It's not gonna be perfect to begin with, we know that. The consistency from say Seven Oaks to Piney Woods will begin with those I can statements. So everybody has the same rubric to use. I also know I'm human and you're human, so we're gonna see it different. So administrators, just as we do now with our PLCs, we're encouraged to have our teachers meet in PLCs, talk about their assessments, calibrate. A lot of times I've had teachers myself give your papers to this teacher, you take this teacher's, score each other's and see how, see how it comes up. Um, and so we'll be encouraging some of that throughout next year. Once we can get, say, third grade at at one of our elementary schools, I won't call one out, but if we have third grade at one of our elementary schools that are consistent, and then another elementary school, their third grade is consistent, and so on, and we have grade levels at each school that are consistent, that's when we'll be able to merge out into, okay, for the year two, now let's talk about how groups of these teachers from each third grade can get together and calibrate and begin to see if we can, we can add to that every year. So one of our neighboring districts has rolled this out already and it took them three years to truly feel like that they were at a place that they felt it was, they were effectively implementing. Um, and I think anything for change, we have to give ourselves three years for that. Um, I think the beauty of this is going to be the conversations that teachers are able to have with parents that are very specific and very intentional about what their child knows. So I hope that answers it. Yeah, I, I didn't sure. completely understand the question, but I was. I had a teacher that um, asked me to uh, sure. run it by you. I, I think the biggest concern is, is just the, the term calibration. Uh, that doesn't mean a whole lot to me, but I know to you guys, you understand it and the teachers understand it. Um, and just among the schools, like if a student transfers from one school to another school uh, ha and, and they don't see, thing, see things on the same level, they grade them differently, the standards, then what, what can the, student, uh, the teachers do? You know, what's, I, I think really, as long as you guys from an administrative standpoint reach out, just make, be available to take care of and address any questions sure. and pro issues. And, and I hope teachers understand that they can, they can reach out and ask those questions as well. Um, I don't want them to get too hung up on that because if they think about the grading that they give right now, I'm not real sure that it's, it's as consistent as possibly this could even be from the beginning. I have a question about the implementation of this and, and the training for the teachers. You said, I mean, this is kind of, you've been talking about this. Um, we've heard a lot about it in the last couple of months because we talked about it at a recent meeting. And, you know, I've heard some folks that are really in favor of it, and I've heard been yelled at by other folks that are really not. Um, but one of the things that I hear that's a, like a common theme is like the training of the teachers and like how much time that will take and when that will happen and whether or not they will be compensated for that because it's kind of like learning how to grade and teach all over again and we're throwing all of it on their shoulders like another thing. So, Right, and we have to remember K2 has always been doing this. So this is not new for our kindergarten mm -hmm. through second grade. This is new for our third through fifth grade teachers. Um, and so our K through two teachers are sort of our experts that we, we call on to help us with, with what, what they've already been doing. Right. Um, 
But I guess my question thing, is geared to, towards both, both you know, secondary and sure. And and so um, as far as the training, one thing that I did request this this summer for ESSER um, is to add. It, we've always given two planning days in the summer. And so I've given schools options if they want to have two additional PD days that teachers could be compensated for, if they want to use that for time for grading PD or whatever PD their school seems to need, they can use it for that. Um, our third grade teachers, I'll be honest, are probably the ones that I'm a little more worried about with their time because K through three starting next year goes into letters training. Um, so, so third grade's gonna have a letters training PD that's got to happen as well as they're gonna have some training with this, with this. So, but we've also accommodated that by asking teachers what they wanted as far as when that training would take place. They're gonna use some early release time and then I'm giving them additional professional development days within their school that they can do some extended planning time to get that planning time back. So we are looking at every possible time that during their normal hours that they would be able to get this training. So, and it's embedded. Um, to learn how to score proficiency based is going to be embedded in what they do. So as they're scoring papers, we'll have coaches and instructional coaches that will be able to assist them right there as they're doing it. Um, so it's not going to be a lot of additional time for them outside of what they've already, you know, they're committed to as well. Okay, I see Ms. Barnhart ha has her hand up, so I'm gonna, Ms. Barnhart? Yeah, I guess I was just asking, um, a lot of the things that you said earlier, talking about, um, you know, telling the, or, or teaching the kids to learn, I'm at this level, or I'm not at this level, or I'm determining where I'm at, um, and giving it kind of back to the kids as to where they are. Is this sort of a, 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 with the implementation of this, is this giving them their self assessments? How, how are we determining where the teacher's voices come in and where they see their students at versus where their kids or the students see that they're at? Right, it's, it's a combination of both. So the students are not gonna give themselves their grades like that's gonna go on the grade book. That's not what I mean by self-assessment. We do want students to be able to identify where they truly are so that they know that they need help or not. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, again, a really strong effect um, strategy to use with, with students. But of course, our teachers are there to also get that feedback from students and then give feedback. Um, so the best, the best use of feedback is you get feedback from the students so you know what type of feedback then to give to them. Um, so I don't, is that what you're asking, Ms. Barnhart? I guess it just kind of, the way that you presented it, it kind of seemed like it was, we were determining our kids' progression on their education based off of how they were feeling about it. And I think that would be something that would go to the teachers um, or the, the, the parent or, or something along those lines. It just, it seemed like the way that you presented that, it seemed like we were gonna tell the, the kids that they would say um, kind of how their education's going. And I think that should be left up to the, the teachers to determine where their kids are being graded and where they're being assessed. Um, based off of what their teachers see out of their individual students, instead of asking the students of where they feel like they are. Well, I'll agree and disagree, um, to be quite honest. Um, I, I agree teachers need to be the ones to help students know that, but it's also important that we help students be lifelong learners of their own and, and to be able to identify where they need assistance to. And so, I think I, I agree and disagree at the same time with what you're saying. Mr. Hogan. So, Ms. McCaspell, thank you for your presentation. Oh, for, for elementary with, with the potential move to standards based for third, fourth, and fifth grade, currently right now when they take a test, when they turn in a project, they get a letter grade, a numeric grade that's affiliated with the, the aptitude of what they put into that versus the, the lesson plan that what they're trying to get out of it. We're still going to continue with that on day-to-day, project-to-project, but those grades will culminate into 
what I vision as more of a roadmap for a student as to the game plan of their education, um, whether they meet, exceed, or need improvement, or whatever acronyms you're using. Um, but by having that, we're, I mean, essentially the pushback I've heard is that these students aren't gonna have a letter grade to strive for, a, a percentage grade. So when we're, we're calculating everything, and I, I see the, the, the importance of standards base, um, of giving the next teacher to get this student in the ability to look and see what he was proficient in, see where he needs improvement on, so they don't lose that foundational building block as they continue going down. But to, to give the students to strive for, could we not do standards base and the letter grade that they're, they earn? It won't work, it won't work. The, the effects of standards based grading is to get away from that number grade. And I still challenge to say, what does the number grade mean? And if, if, we're, if we want to challenge our students to go for something, they need to go for MET. Mm. That's what they need to go for. Um, because to go for 100 in this teacher's class could be very different than going for 100 in this teacher's class. And y'all, we've all been in those classrooms, right? We've all been in the ones where if you come out with an 80, you're just as happy as if you came out with a 90 in somebody else's classroom, right? Correct. And so we want to go from that. Um, and, and that, I think if you think about the stress of grades that students have, the stress is the number. The stress is not the learning. And I want the stress to be the learning. And if they go from MET, then they're learning. Mr. Satterfield. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, your presentation was very good. Uh, my question, I guess I do have a question along the lines of evaluation, I guess, and I think that's sort of what continues to crop up. Uh, and by the way, teachers, teachers have been teaching standard-based teaching all along. This is not a new concept. They've been, they, a lot of them write their standards at the bottom of their lesson plans to meet the, the state standards. Um, I know that one of the issues in some of the schools I've worked with uh, is when students move from out of district. I mean, from school to school, there should be uniformity and consistency or as close to it as you can get it because of expectations, but students that move from out of district, say from, I don't want to say the county, but another county, and they're coming into fourth grade, and they're probably really somewhere around second grade as far as their learning. Um, I, I'm hoping that this tool sort of helps even the playing field. I guess my question, getting to my question now is, um, back when you did the math, you showed an example of the math standards on the slide. There are a lot of standards. I, I don't, I'm not sure how many math standards there are, say, in third grade, but there are a lot. Um, if a student is proficient in some, but not in all, how do you determine if they're ready or not to go to the fourth grade? Right, and so that was those retention guidelines that I told you about that we would look at as far as, um, again, it's not a black and white when you're in elementary school. Um, it's not if you, if you pass or you don't pass, it's, it's really about maturity and all that. But we would look at, say, the percentage of MET standards within ELA and math. So the, is there a set percentage or well, what do they look for over, I don't mean to interrupt you, but do they look for overlapping standards that maybe they can meet in the next grade level? We would look at all of that. Right now, what, what we're looking at, and we're getting input from teachers even on this percentage right now, but right now we're saying if there's 50% or greater that they are not met in, that that would be a student that we would want to think about talking about retention. Okay. I, I don't know. Miss Little, go ahead. Um, I guess I have a procedure question for you is, um, are we, is this going to move to the action agenda at some point? So that was another thing that I was going to bring up um, tonight because uh, we have gotten a lot of emails and there's a lot of, I mean, I have a lot of questions that are flying to me about this. But when I talked to Dr. Ross about this at our board officer meeting about where this was on our agenda, um, Dr. Ross told me that this was not something that the board voted on and that it was an administrative rule and that, um, this was one of many conversations that was going to happen over several meetings and that it wouldn't even be implemented next year. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring that up 
tonight uh, because we've had that question. Well, and I researched it. Yeah. And, and um, the board has, um, there, and the policy says that certain administrative rules will be voted on by the board. This administrative rule actually went through two readings and board approval um, in 2016, two readings and board approval in 2019. So right. twice in a row. It got changed August of last year, and I didn't even know it got changed. So, I mean, I think there's a precedence, especially for this rule, that the board does two readings and approves it. Okay. Um, that is definitely something that the board can talk about. But that was a question that I had because um, I've had a lot of, like I said, I mean, there's a lot of conversation happening about this. Um, with parents that don't understand how their kids are going to be assessed, with teachers that don't understand whether or not they're going to be learning on the fly, and whether or not they're going to be expected to implement this change without, and if they are, I mean, that they're taking on additional duties. So what does that mean? I mean, I'm kind of harping on that because I think it's, it needs to be clarified. And also, like, what is the district's plan on, like, providing resources? Like, are all of the assessments going to be the same? Like you mentioned, like, an 80 in one class is different than an 80 in this class. But if we're changing the whole way we're grading, the problem, yes. the problem is these are the same questions that we should be having if we're, if we're not changing the grading process at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't – so I'm a little – I guess I'm a little confused over some of those questions. Because right now, we don't give the same, we don't tell the teachers that you're going to give every test and here is the test, we give it to you. Right. We give them lots of resources. Progress learning is one of them. That's all standards-based assessments that they can go in and all they have to do is choose their, their standard and there's like a bank of questions that they can choose from. Our new uh, textbooks adoptions, they all have standards-based um, test banks to go in and choose from those. Um, so we have all of that, and, and we should be assessing standards regardless of what test, what, what, what grading we are, we're using. We, and we are. Our teachers are assessing standards. It's just that it's going to be reported in a very different way. Um, and again, K2 has been doing this for a long time, um, we're adding 3-5 um, to show the importance of the standard, not the importance of the number, um, and to see that we are, we are making sure that parents have a clear, just like when we asked what you wanted out of grades, you wanted a clear understanding of what students knew and did not know. That's what this will do for you. So as far as extra duties, we would be grading papers regardless. We're still grading papers. We're, you, we're, we're not doing anything different than we have always done. We're, just, we're not going to do both. We're not going to grade it on a 100-point scale and on a standards-based scale. We're only going to grade it on a standards-based scale. Any other? Ms. Ms. Yeah, I want to make one other point in favor of what you're talking about. Teachers have, for several years now, they have uh, been involved with data teams, and they are examining that data constantly based on whether or not students meet those standards. And so if I had a class of 25 kids, I've got 25 completely different learners. I've got some kids that have IEPs, 504s. I've got kids with high IQs. IQs like mine, not so high. Um, but the point being is that teachers are constantly getting that data together and analyzing and seeing where you are and where Mr. Hogan is and where Ms. Snipes is, and, and they're adjusting that instruction. It's, a, it's an arduous, it's a difficult task. It is really, really tough. And I know this process is going to be a tough transition, too, because like Dr. Ross and I discussed before, this is the way it's always been. And when I was in school, you got an A, B, C, or D, and that was, you pretty much understood it. It was a universal language. So moving to the metric system will not be an easy thing, that's for sure. But I, I want to make sure that people understand that teachers, they do go through this long process and they examine their data and every child's learning constantly 
and then they talk and they have these teams and they get together and they talk about the best way of presenting so that they can meet the challenges of those students. But imagine having 25 completely different learners in your classroom. So um, they are very professional at that, that's for sure. And change is hard. So what you said is absolutely right. Change is hard. And there is nobody that's expecting it to be perfect to begin with. Um, and, and we're going to be right there alongside them to support. It's not going to be go jump in the lake and swim on your own without, without us beside you. Um, that's not what it's going to be. Do you know how many districts have implemented this like district-wide for both elementary and secondary schools? Um, now, for both, I am not that, we're, I mean, really, there's two different, different topics it's here. Two different, it's, yes, two yeah, different things. Yeah, there's two things. different conversations, so yeah. As, as far as the elementary, there are... There are three right in our area. Um, one is moving there next year, and two have already implemented this right in our area. Okay. Um, and it's like I told you last time, the secondary piece, we're being transparent with it. Other districts just do it and don't put it in their board policy. Any more questions before she continues? We kind of hijacked your presentation. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> but, but, oh, before, sorry, sorry. before we go on to the um, secondary schools, um, I just wanted to share the feedback I've gotten and that from many teachers that it is more work um, because, like you said, I mean, right now you you offer a, you know a fifty point quiz and they get. 45 of them right, that's a 90, potentially, you know, and that the, the, the um, report cards are going to be a lot more work. And so that's from the teachers, and I've yet, I'm not saying they don't exist, and I'm, I know people only, you know, bring up things that they're unhappy about, but I haven't heard from anyone that said, I like this, not one. Um, from the parents, I've heard kind of the same thing, is that they already have access to power school, and they can go in there, and they can see very easily how their students are doing in different grades. And then the biggest concern I've had for, from parents is um, children go through an enormous change when they go to middle school. It's, that's hard enough, socially um, and everything else. And then to all of a sudden, that be their introduction to big kid grades, the, the parents are worried about that. So I just want to share that feedback that I've gotten from many people um, on those kind of issues. I've gotten similar feedback and really I'm harping on the implementation and the additional work because that's what I'm hearing. I have heard people, I have heard teachers agree with this in theory. It's the, it's the implementation and the additional work and um, it's like you take two steps for, or one step forward and two steps back on the amount of the workload. And so I just don't want to under score that because, um, whether it's a board vote or not. I mean, this is a conversation that's happening and it's impacting the teachers and we're hearing about it. So I just, um, I just kind of wanted to, yeah. All right. I'm hearing Ms. it Hines, as well. Ms. Hines, I'm, I would like to just echo yep. what you just said and what Ms. Um, Huddle just said too. I've heard from my constituents as well. This is a very difficult topic and, and this is things that people are talking about. And so we, we really need to make sure that we get this right. And grading is a very personal topic, period. It's just not going to be a really happy topic for anybody. You change grading, it's just not going to be happy. It's just not. But when you change it at the same time of, of the way that things have already gone, I, I guess it, my question is, is why, why um, change things that are already going the way that they have been? Yeah, Mr. Uh, Dr. Ross. Uh, I I keep putting uh, Ms. McCaskill in, in the crossfires for, for something I've asked her to do. Um, and I just want to share every, every board meeting I present to you, blue bars and red bars. Do we know what those red bars don't know? How do we turn those, blue bar, those red bars into blue bars if we can't drill down specifically what those deficits are? Some of these deficits are not in that current grade. How does an eighth grader have a first grade reading level? That's what they ask us. And how does that ninth grade teacher or that eighth grade teacher make it up if they don't know specifically from previous what those missing gaps were? We're about to talk about secondary. 
On a 100-point scale, how many grades can you give? The answer is 101. 11 of those for A's, 10 for B's, 10 for C's, 10 for D's, 60 for F. So whether you're on 100 or, or 50, at the end of the day, I got to make sure that these kids graduate ready for career. How do I know what those red bars don't know when they have a 72? So for, our, for us to have these I can statements aligned to uh, competencies, I think is, is again, is it, is it the, the easiest thing to do? No, but, but leaders don't step in for the easy stuff. And these kids need help specifically on those skills. I told the staff the other day, if I have to put all our children in the lake and we're responsible for teach swimming, we need to know what competencies these kids know and don't know so that they're prepared for those tasks. I say this, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, because we're gonna be held accountable for <clears throat> the opportunity to turn each one of those red bars into blue bars, meeting the expectations. And a lot of our students are coming to us from different states, from different districts, uh, from different grading systems. And if we can pinpoint through the state standards what they know and what they don't know, it will go a longer way for us to be able to meet their, their needs. That's why I support the change. I know it's tough, I know it's difficult, but I think we all will grow. In terms of the vote, um, my, my goal was in, uh, to not move this forward out of discussion until we felt comfortable with it. That's my goal, not to act on it, whether it's board or administrative, until we had this discussion. But I will say this and then I'll be quiet. We have been talking about this for three years. It's when we move it forward that people engage. Once it feels like it's going to change, like it's going to happen, that's when the engagement happens. So if it takes this to make people lean into this conversation, then, then I think that's been a success. So uh, I'll take full responsibility and blame. I wanna thank Ms. McCaskill for jumping in front of, the, of this, but I don't know a better way to help with these learning deficits of two years and three years and four years behind grade level without knowing specifically what these children don't know and don't know. I guess that's kind Madam of the Chair, question. Madam hold Chair, on, like on Ms. Barnhart, like Barnhart, hold on a second. I think that's the question that I have here is I get where I get what you're saying, but like, how are we going to demonstrate proficiency with students, and how are we making sure that like like now that we're trying to implement it, that you know it matters. Like the details matter. It's a, a big picture vision sounds great. You know we obviously want to fix the red bars, but how are we like demonstrating that proficiency has happened? What like what? How are we actually doing that? Because th that, those are the questions that teachers are asking. Um, obviously, you know, everybody knows what the district administration wants, and, and that, that's great. If it, if it works, that it would be great. But if it doesn't, it is a disaster um, in, in measuring the, grace, the growth of our students from the way that I see it. So I'm trying to figure out, like, how are we making sure that we're, assess we're all assessing the same way third, fourth, fifth, and when we get, you know, I, I know there's another conversation, but I mean, those are the questions that, that are being asked because it's not, what does that look like? What does an assessment look like? How do you, Mr. Satterfield brought up every student, every learner is different. You have 25 different learners in a classroom. How is a teacher assessing all of the different types of, of learners in a uniform way where you're finding the proficiency. Does that make sense? It, it makes uh, perfect sense. And I think um, what we will do, um, and, and what we have, if you can go back to the report card, uh, this, as, the, as Ms. Satterfield said, should be happening every day. In fact, so there's assignments, and then there's grading based on the standards. So if you take chapter seven history tests, all right, you can do a hundred questions, give 1% for each question, but all of that may be on one standard. So what is chapter seven actually assessing? Which standard is it assessing? 
we don't know. And the student can't say, I can execute the standards. So for instance, and, and I don't have a problem with what uh, Mr. Hogan said. If what comes home is the traditional 100%, but it's aligned to the ICANs, that's good implementation for me. But I think what has to happen is that when we look up um, each one of these, and I, I'm dealing with it right now in my house. My child gets a 72, and I'll disclose his FERPA. <laughs> I don't know what that means in the grade book. I know parents say they do, but I, I don't know what that means. When his Thursday folder comes home, and I can see he can't divide fractions. It allows, that teacher is communicating to me, this is the deficit that your son has, so your tutor needs to work on that. We spend, of, in terms of academic interventions and those things, so when Let's just say I want to do an easily impl implementation from that. And Ms. McCaskill may disagree with me, but I'm going to give a 100 point scale on uh, uh, ICAM 1. And I see a kid that has 70%, uh, and I call that progressing. A kid that has 85%, and I call that, that meets. That would be more, in my opinion, alignment than what we currently have going on right now. Because if you're at school A and I'm at school B and, and you did assignments that I haven't seen and it's not aligned to these standards, how do I know we're, we're, we, our students are in the same level? So I think what happens is, to Mr. Satterfield's point, you talked about a data team. This is more at its core. We never use data teams, we use PLCs, but a district-wide PLC. Because what do all PLCs start with? The learning outcomes. And that's how this calibrates. Now how you assess it and how I assess it, a teacher A and teacher B might assess it a different way. You might just assess dividing fractions with a cool manipulative. I may do stand and deliver lecture. We're gonna do different things. And at the end, we look and we say, you know, 80% of your kids met this objective. Only 20% of mine did. I may want to learn some of the things that you're doing. So I think for us, I know it's, um, it's new, and it, um, but there's a faulty premise on the start, and that is that this is new, because we should be assessing standards even on the 100% scale. So I think for us and, and to the board, I want to uh, tell our teachers, our parents, our faculty and staff community, we're not moving forward until we have this debate and this discussion, until we feel a level of comfort. But I also have to stand firm and say, as an instructional leader, this is how we should be grading anyway. We should be grading based on their ability to accomplish the standards. So I, I, I don't want to feel that tonight something has to move forward. I think um, we haven't heard from all the faculty advisories. We just talked to our faculty advisory on this, so we want to give them time to, to have that. It is bringing forth a lot of questions that we can clear up. So I think once we hear from all our faculty advisories, we heard from our parent groups, uh, we continue to bring this up. But I think for us, going from metric to the American system, uh, bodes us having more of these conversations. Ms. McCaskill, agree. can you continue? Absolutely. I apologize. <laughs> no, you're fine. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the um, uniform grading system which really takes us into more of our 6 through 12 conversation about grading. And I believe you all got a copy of the uniform grading policy as well in your packet. But this is what it looks like um, in a small scale. It's much larger um, your, your policy is. But this is where we're looking at for the uniform grading scale. And so the big, the big thing here to take away is when a student has a withdrawal fail, they're gonna get a 50 on their report card. If a student does not come to class, they miss too much seat time, they can't make up their seat time, 
So they get what's called an FA, that's failure because of attendance. They're going to get a 50 on their report card. That's the state regulation, that's the state policy, that's going to happen. That doesn't matter what we decide here, that's going to happen, okay? Um, and so, also in that packet you saw Carnegie units, anything 49 and below are going to get the same Carnegie units as a 50 is going to get. So it, it's exactly the same. And we can't change that for FAs or anything below a 50, regardless. So your Carnegie units are always going to be that. We can't, that's not something that we can make a decision about. So as I was doing some research, these two words really stood out to me because the questions that I've been getting from teachers, I've realized that they were very confused about what exactly we were saying we were, we were moving towards. Um, and so there's two different types of minimum gradings. There's a micro minimum grading and a macro medium grading, minimum grading. Micro is where every single test that you give, you don't give anything less than a 50. So a student makes a zero, they're going to get a 50 in the grade book. They do this assignment, they make a 20, they're going to get a 50. This assignment, they make a 60, well, they get the 60. So whatever assignment, every assignment, a 50 is the minimum score. That's micro minimum grading. Macro minimum, minimum grading is where whatever the student makes on each assignment, they're going to get it. So let's say they make a 15, they make an 80 one time, then they make a 20. They, whatever grade they get, the parent's going to see that grade in the grade book. At the end of the nine weeks, when we average everything, if they have a 40 for their average, then the final average is going to be a 50. If they have a 20, the final average is going to be a 50. If they have an 80, the final average is going to be an 80. Just we want the final average will not be less than a 50. That goes back to what Dr. Ross was talking about when you have that 0 to 100 scale and you've got 60, 60 scores that can be an F, but you have 10 scores that can be everything else except an A has 11 scores. So that's numerically putting this on an equal scale but then it's also making things equitable with withdrawal fail and with FAs. So micro, macro. Everything I talk about from this point forward is macro. So micro is out the door. Don't even think about that. Okay? All right. There's a research study. And I'll tell you, it's hard to find research about minimum grading. Um, but this research study went on for seven years. Um, it, went, it was in a, was the University of Massachusetts actually took it on. They had school-wide policy that in all semester courses that any grade that was below a 50% in the first quarter would become a 50. So they had semester courses, so they only had like two quarters that they were averaging together. The purpose was to target a specific student population and the students who have an early failure in a semester course and who even though they receive passing or even high grades in the second quarter are, cons are consigned to fail because of a low unsalvageable first quarter grade. So the question is, would the minimum grading policy result in social promotion and grade inflation in which students would be promoted undeservedly? Which is exactly what we think about whenever we think about this. So this is the question that the researchers um, researched. There were 343,000 grades to, uh, were assigned to nearly 11,000 students. Only three, only three tenths of the students received a 50% grade in the first quarter of the semester course and then ultimately passed with a 75% or likely a D. But the bullet just above that says, any claims that minimum grading was leading to large numbers of students passing courses they would otherwise be failing were clearly not true. The finding was, was the 50% minimum grade was found to prevent the disproportionate and unsound mathematical impact of sub-50 scores, especially the zero, on the 100-point scale. 
Minimum grading minimizes the impacts of intermittent catastrophic performance failures that certain groups of students experience and even have tendencies to experience. So those students who benefited from this were those students who maybe had surgery or they had a death in the family or they had some major traumatic event during the quarter that really plummeted their grades for that quarter. And so then they got the 50 and they were able to come back and make, make up for it in the second quarter. All the research shows that this doesn't help our extreme underperforming students because they're just gonna get straight 50s and a 50's an F. This really targets those students who have major issues at some point and they're able to redeem themselves, I guess is the best way I can say that. But no research supports the idea that assigning low grades as punishment encourages students to try harder or do better. In fact, Gusky writes, instead of prompting greater effort, low grades often cause students to withdraw from learning. To protect their self-images, many students regard the low grade as irrelevant or meaningless. Others may blame themselves for the low grade, but feel helpless to improve. And that's what I talked about. I want students to really not stress over that low, low grade. I want them to focus on the learning. But what happens with so many of our high school students, we know that there's a lot of mental health issues, and a lot of it comes from the stress of grades. That's where it comes from. But the conclusion is the minimum grade is not inflation, and it's not teaching students to be unmotivated. It's restoring mathematical accuracy, and it motivates struggling students because it preserves the possibility of redemption and success. So what secondary schools would actually see, parents would see the actual grades on all assignments in PowerSchool. Then 50 would level the playing field for students who are attending and at least completing some assignments with those who get an FA or a WF. And that would take place at the end of each quarter. And then our credit recovery would be updated to say that you would have to be at least a 55 to qualify for credit recovery. And I will answer any questions that you might have. These are the references um, for the presentation. Mr. Satterfield. You knew I had a question. Sure. Uh, a minute ago, you showed the data. It said 343,000 students and only 0.3% even got a D. Then you said that it no way was it going to motivate students. So what's the purpose of giving them 50? If, if, only, if it only affects 0.3% of the students. Uh, I, one of the things that I know that we've had a discussion for before in the past, I've had with some other um, people in education is, elementary, we talked earlier about not met or, or working our way toward a certain standard. And, and that's what learning, that's what we wanna do is measure our outcomes. Mm -hmm. If a student is in that first semester or that first quarter uh, failing, why don't we just withdraw and it, it doesn't count against them at all and then put them in a skinny the second semester and give them another chance to pass the course? Because if it's a Carnegie unit, they have to have it to graduate, correct? Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, I, I, I um, and I've shared with Dr. Ross before in, in conversations that I, I wish we did more for those, because we do get a lot of students that do come from, I mean, we're getting more transient. We're getting a lot more students from out, outside our district. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I wish we did more to supplement those learners, whether it be through team teaching in a classroom. I know that costs a little more, or more, um, more opportunities after school, you know, uh, for tutoring and things like that. But I, 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 do, I just struggle with the fact that teachers, one of the biggest issues that teachers face right now is students won't get off their cell phone and they won't do their work. I mean, you can ask, you could poll any high school in our district and they'll say that's the number one issue that they've got, a disrespect and students just won't do their any work. 
So I think that the perception is going to be, and especially if it only helps 0.3% of the students, is that they're, they're not doing their work and now they're going to get an automatic 50. Does that make sense? I I, what you're I, I, and I just wish that we would address it from the other end in finding ways of helping the kids learn because in, in, the, in the end they need that math, science, and English to, to get out of, to graduate from high school. So Dr. Ross gets more of the, the, the right bars that he wants there. And we all want that certain outcome. That's all. Thank you. Sure. And I guess I would ask, what is three-tenths of a percent of 11,000 students? Because I can't do that in my head immediately. But that's a lot of students for us to think that that helped that many students. It's three-tenths of a percent of 11,000 students. I understand that. But you mentioned that for those students that were going through a difficult thing like a, a death in the family, they didn't pull 343,000 students who had a death in the family. They just arbitrarily picked 343,000 students. So maybe 10% maybe of them had an issue, a major issue. I, I don't know. It doesn't say anything in, there, in your research there. But, um, and I know this is not the world according to Mike Satterfield. I understand that. But uh, I just know that Motivating kids, finding ways is, is, has always been a struggle. It's a struggle for teachers. It's been a struggle, for, especially for those lower uh, achieving students. I wish we, and if they, don't, if they don't qualify for extra help, resource, be it as it may, um, we don't really offer too much for those students, except we put them in little groups and they travel around in little light classes and, and make teachers nervous. and. Teachers have to really work hard to try to help those students when they get in high school, and they're not really all that motivated. So I just wish there was a different type of discussion on how to help those students than artificially giving them a grade. That's my comment. And those Thank discussions you. are happening. They're just not necessarily things we have to bring to the board. Just, just want to put that out there. If I, if I may, I think uh, to your point, Mr. Satterfield, one of the things that we should we'll bring around budget time as we talk about are those pathways. Uh, and, and we both remember the days when we had extra planning for department chairs or we had extra planning for how uh, we can put those in. Uh, Ms. McCaskill and I met with the assistant principals for instruction about uh, some, some new possible four by fours uh, that will bring um, especially in algebra and, and kind of innovative places to meet some of the students that are in that space. But you're right. I think the, the notion is for the kids who do get to F, whether it's a 50 F or a zero F, we need to have some, some more uh, uh, programs. And, and we'll, we're excited about bringing those for you at budget time. Any more questions? I do. Ms. Barnhart? Yeah, I just... I... <laughs> And I hate to go back on this because, I mean, it was a, a terrible time and an uncomfortable time in our life, but have we looked into what happened with the COVID years and what happened when the kids were sent home from school and they were learning on Chromebooks or, you know, technology and they didn't get to be around their teachers. They didn't get to be there with their teachers and, and learn the way that they were supposed to learn. Has that effect, have we looked into the way of how that affected our kids um, as to how we're, we're starting to look at them now and how we're grading them now and how we're talking to them now? Has that been anything within the administration's kind of uh, just investigation into this and the grading procedures as to to how kids are, are being graded now and what COVID and the COVID lockdowns and all of that might have affected them in a certain way? Is that a question that we're even looking into? Our major, uh, our major focus um, has been on what the, the state and, and through the uh, three ESSER series have been called learning loss the assessment of where students should be and then where we have them. And we've seen a larger gap of that, that learning loss. Uh, our goal has been through summer reading um, and through as we have uh, brought quarterly ESSER updates to show you what we're doing in order to kind of regain that, that, that learning loss. And of course, not having that face-to-face -face time uh, does have an impact. I think that's one of the reasons more now to get in order for us to, to get that back for these children 
is to be able to drill down to these specific skill sets that are there, especially as the standards are changing. So um, while our, our, for the last three years, we have been responsible uh, through the ESSER to, to look at that specifically learning loss. But Ms. McCaskill, is there something I missed there you can add? No, that's exactly what I was thinking because we've been doing lots of um, our maps, our map testing really looks at what our students, where they are, what they need. It allows teachers to drill down into those deficits that they have. Um, hope, thankfully, we're beginning to see our test scores get back really past where they were at COVID, which is which is good to see. Um, but yes, the COVID years had, had major impact on our students, but it's now in, in lots of ways. I mean, in motivation ways as well as in their learning loss. So there's just lots of things that we're having to, to rethink and re-engage with students because the way that they engage with us in classrooms has changed since that time, as well as how, um, how, we, how we need to assess and teach as well. No, I think I guess my question is, is just wondering, you know, we talk about these learning losses and all these things that we're talking about to get the kids back on the track, which we absolutely need to do. And we need to give all the um, resources to our teachers in order to help our teachers, because our teachers went through a hard time, too, within COVID. Um, and they had to be a lot of things that they were not, you know, kind of trained to be. And so I think that it would be just good of us to talk about that with of what happened during COVID and what our teachers lost, what our children lost um, during those years and how we can make up for that going forward. Ms. Huddle. Um, I had a few questions you, you mentioned, and I don't, I think this actually applied more to the earlier, to the grade three through five, but you said three area districts, I think you said had already implemented that is that correct? And if three so, three districts. Three districts. There's two districts nearby, and one is moving to it next year. Okay, who are the those three, if you don't mind? Um, so Lexington one has already started it. Kershaw County is um, looking at it for next year, and um, it's one of the right up right past Newberry Greenwood area, and I can't remember the exact district it was, but it's in that area. Okay. And I then, can get the name of it for you. Okay, I was just curious. And then also, is any of this um, that we were talking about tonight, is any of this required by the state? The UGP is required by the state. What's the, but none of the, the, the movement to the standards base for three through fifth is not required? No. Okay. Um, and then the other question I had, and just so I understand how, how does the FA work with recapture? So let's say you have a student that is getting a 50 because of the absences, but the absences will also keep them from getting the course as completed, right? Yeah. So do they just not do recapture because they're gonna make an F anyway, or how does that work? Well, you've got credit recovery and then you've got recapture. And recapture is your seat time. And so um, it, if they get an FA, that means that they can't recapture their seat time. It's too much. And so they wouldn't be able to even do credit recovery because of the attendance. Is okay. That, is so, that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, that is what I'm asking. So I just want to make sure by the, by the time they've accumulated enough missed seat time to get an FA, are you saying it's too late to do recapture? Well, so, so recapture for seat time can be done throughout the semester or throughout the, you know, throughout the semester. So once they get to the point of the end of the semester, let's just say, you can only make up so much seat time. And so once you get past that point and you go on beyond it, you're an FA because you can't make up the time. So the kids that are doing the, the recapture probably don't have an F. I mean, they're probably doing the recapture That's so correct. they won't get an F. Correct. Okay. Um, it's not, it's related to this obviously, but 
I mean, I would just love to have a, a discussion at some point on, on absenteeism because I think it's gotten much worse since COVID and that's probably the root of this issue is that is the absenteeism just sounds, I, mean, I bet the kids that are there every day aren't getting twenties in class. Yeah. So anyway, you've listened in on some conversations, I believe, because <laughs> we've had lots of that. Anyone else? Mr. Scully. Yeah, um, no, I'm in favor of this. To me, the point of this is keeping the kids who are trying, giving them a mathematical chance. And to, to your point about motivation, that's the only way that you're going to continue to motivate kids. If you are mathematically out of the equation from the jump because you had a terrible first semester, first quarter, or whatever, you have a look, there's no motivation to continue trying. There's nothing. My, my child is in that situation this year. Now, she, it's elementary, but in math, she's, she had a terrible first quarter for a semester. Um, it is, and I've, we've seen her be extremely demotivated as a result. But as long as she mathematically has a chance to continue a chip in a chair, that's what this is. This is a chip in a chair. As long as you have a chip in a chair, you're still in the game. You're going to still play and keep trying. In the bottom of the ninth inning on Saturday, Clemson was down nine runs, eight runs. They still had a chance. They kept playing, kept fighting, and they came back and won. Had they been ten runs down, they didn't have a shot. This is keeping them in the game. It's the motivation. And... I, that's where the, the kids who consistently fail, who don't try, who are on their cell phones, they will continue to fail, continue to, there's no motivation for them to do anything either way, but at least for the kids who do have catastrophic, like you said, intermittent catastrophic, catastrophic events, it keeps them in the game mathematically. And so I, I, I think it's a good thing, and I think it's something we should consider. Any other questions? I feel like we will continue this conversation and there will be more conversation. Thank you for taking the fire, Ms. McCaskill, no <laughs> with all of these questions. All. But I know that we will continue to have questions and we appreciate your answers. And I'm happy to send the complete, I've got two research articles. I'm happy yes. to send them to you. I've only gave you highlights of them. So I'm happy to send those to you. Yes. I noticed that they're a little bit dated. That's all there is. Okay. Interesting. All right. Done lots of research, I all promise. Right. But I that's all there I is. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that is it for the grading presentation. Thank you very much. And that moves us to 18, which is the teacher supplemental signing bonus. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the board and our, our community. I want to talk about an opportunity uh, to assist our teachers with a supplemental signing bonus. This is a, a new uh, method that I would like to bring uh, for the board's consideration. Today is just discussion only, uh, but uh, we would ask for, uh, at a subsequent meeting, action, action on this. Um, one of the things that we heard from the uh, 2024 Personnel Winter Conference um, when uh, Dr. Turner came back, we had this, this discussion with the entire staff about the projected workforce uh, for, through uh, 2030. Now, uh, Frank Rainwater and his team uh, have put together uh, this graph from the South Carolina Revenue and Physical Affairs Office, and you can see bluer areas of the state represent where the workforce population is growing and projected to grow. Uh, you see the brown areas of the state are where the workforce population is projected to shrink and the, the degree in which it will shrink. The areas that are in gray are stable. As you can see for Lexington and Richland counties, we're in a stable area. So yes, the state of South Carolina is growing in population. A lot of people are moving here, but in terms of the workforce population, those who are willing or are, are in that working uh, field, that is declining. What's also declining is the number of, of, of college students seeking teaching degrees. If, uh, if you look at our report that was uh, published last week, 
I think it was in the state newspaper, about uh, the percent of uh, overall uh, U.S. degrees that were issued in 7071. I think 21 percent of all degrees were in education degrees. The largest uh, percent of, uh, of degrees were in education. Uh, if you look at that and run it to uh, two years ago, I think it was 4.4 percent. So over time, we're losing the amount uh, in that, that, that pool. So that's why we're looking at putting a lot of attention on uh, retention and then growing the pool. When we look at our teacher workforce, I asked Dr. Turner to uh, just uh, take all of our, our teachers, our 1,445 teachers, and then put them by generation. Uh, and uh, what we found is that two trends that exist in the U.S. workforce uh, one exists in District 5 and one does not. Uh, Generation Z being a larger percentage of the workforce than the baby boomers, that exists in District 5 and exists in the global, uh, in the U.S. workforce. However, millennials are a larger part or the largest part of the U.S. workforce, but not, um, uh, but not here in District 5. So what does this mean for us? As Generation X begins uh, for uh, to be eligible for Social Security benefits in three years, being in a stable workforce projected area, as we lose employees, uh, we're not necessarily going to be able to get them back. They're not moving to this area at those high degrees as projected. And so our goal is every district in, in the state of South Carolina is going to be uh, fighting over the same pool of teachers. Um, our best way of addressing this, uh, we're looked at, have been for, for uh, since this summer, looking at an article from uh, the uh, Harvard Business Review about uh, employee value propositions. And so we're going to talk about material offerings, but it's also connection and community, meaning and purpose, growth and development. Um, making sure that employees um, are appreciated and recognized, and understanding the difference between those. We turn to uh, writers in this, in this field, uh, Gary Chapman, who famously wrote in 1992, The Five Love Languages. He teamed with uh, Paul White in 2019, psychologist uh, Paul White, and developed the five languages of appreciation in the workplace. Acts of service, receiving gifts, quality time, words of affirmation, and as Dr. Turner says, physical touch that must be appropriate and not violate the employee handbook. As a result, when you look at these, uh, we actually uh, met with our faculty advisory, we met with our principals, and just asked what was, what was their workplace appreciation language. And um, our faculty advisory, these are all of the teachers of the year for School District 5. Now, that best thing to do a survey of 1,445 teachers, but we just did the 26 since they were all in the room. This is all of our sites plus our last year teacher of the year. And you can see nobody wants to be touched. So the um, quality time, acts of service, and words of affirmation, these are things that uh, we are committing uh, to, to, to get better at uh, for our teachers to be, uh, when you look at um, uh, teacher appreciation, sometimes you do one thing for all and what the book is saying, what the research is saying, and what our teachers are saying is that there's not one thing that you can do that makes everyone feel appreciated. Everyone has to be appreciated individually. And so we did this for our principals, and you can see, um, unlike the teachers, they wanted some gifts. But um, this was just giving us an idea of there's not one slice of this pie that covers everyone. Everyone has a specific uh, way of feeling uh, appreciated and evaluated uh, and, and recognized. And so um, we, we share this just to share uh, that uh, while providing gifts and while providing supplements is part of the, the, the task that we do, we recognize in administration we have a long way to go in making sure that we can bring these five workplace appreciations uh, to the ground, but authentically. And it has to be through, uh, through a relationship with our principals. And so um, with that, um, we wanted to share that as our path uh, forward. Uh, but tonight, we wanted the, the board to consider 
still, as we uh, look to recruit and retain teachers, uh, supporting us with a fund balance assignment that we're actually issuing now. And that is new. Uh, we usually wait into the, uh, until after the fiscal year. Uh, when I say the fiscal year, the, the, the school year, we usually do this in the fall. Um, but I ask uh, our interim CFO, Ms. Marty Rolls, um, given where we are with teachers, given the shrinking pool, could we assign uh, $800,000 of fund balance from positions we haven't filled? Let's put that on the ground now. Let's use that now um, because by August or September or November of next year, it will be too late. Uh, we will have the reports about um, how many vacancies you have and how many teachers you need to hire. I wanted to be proactive and use some of that uh, before it hits uh, the fund balance. So I know this is new to issue a one-time $500 supplemental signing bonus. This would be issued to every teacher who signs with us. Um, and this is uh, May 11th after the critical May 10th date, Dr. Turner, where that's the due date for all of the contracts. So on May 11th, that's where we would say who's eligible, and that would run through July 1st, really June 30th. Uh, by, by July 1, uh, um, you, you have to do it by July 1. So uh, the amount would be $500. Uh, we would take care of the FICA uh, in that, um, but the allowances, we, we can't account for. Those are very different. So we just wanted to offer this for uh, discussion. Again, no action. Uh, but what is new is we usually wait till um, after the year uh, to do a, a fund balance assignment. I just feel like the timing of, of this is of the essence. Uh, I see a critical need to do as much as we can to recruit and retain teachers, and that's why I present the signing bonus. And I stand for any questions. Any questions? Ms. Huddle. Um, how many bonuses is this? This would be two this year we did one well i meant like i'm sorry i meant like how many people oh. would get this because i did the math and it came out like 1560 does that sound right no. it seems high okay but well, it goes back to me. actually i'll ask my other question first so are we grossing up the fica or just adding the fica i know you know what are we grossing up the fica because we still have to charge fica on it Right, so when you gross up, it adds a lot more than the 7%, so that what you're trying to do is get it where they actually get 500, or are we just paying the 7%? We're gonna pay both sides. Okay, so we'll pay their 7%. So instead of 500, they'll get whatever that is, you know. Minus allowances. $530 or whatever. And, and we will not be uh, paying the allowances. So whatever their um, federal and state income taxes are, that will come out of it. But the FICA, we will be paying. Okay. Yes. Um, so the if y'all could let us know how many people, because I must be doing something wrong on my calculator, because I got you know 1,500 people. When you're looking at the language there, we can break it down. Um, but in order to qualify for this, there are a few criteria. First, you have to be on the certified pay scale. And so we've pulled all the positions that qualify and we've eliminated the positions that don't. We have that list already. So we can go through and provide to Dr. Ross the numbers beside each one and that'll clarify what's excluded and what's included. But we specifically put, you have to be on a certified pay scale so um, do principals get it too? No, ma'am. They're okay. on the administrative okay, pay so they're scale. On the, okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, and then, oh, the $838,000, Dr. Ross. So that is coming out of, because of turnover, you're never 100% filled in all your positions. So that's where that money's coming from. Okay, thanks. Also, that's the maximum amount. Obviously, it's not going to be 100%, so it would not be greater than the number that's represented. Any other questions? Mr. Satterfield? I, I don't really have a question. I do have a comment, though. I, I, looking at the graph that Dr. Ross shared with us, I want to sort of emphasize or try to emphasize something. $500 is good 
it's a nice gesture. It really is. It's not going to change anybody's life. They're not going to go buy a bigger house or fancier car or whatever with it. Um, but looking at the graph, these words of affirmation, um, Dr. Ross probably won't remember this, but when we first arrived at a school that we worked together, the, the school spirit and all was pretty low. We, and we worked really hard at it. And I feel like we established such a great climate. But it took a lot of effort. We couldn't just say that we appreciated teachers. I mean, the, the $500 will be a nice gesture. But I think in this political climate that we have and floating around today, and I think that I was talking with a, a former a retired teacher whose daughter is a teacher in Tennessee, and she says teachers there are scared to death. They're scared to speak up. They're scared to say anything because of the contentious board meetings and things like that. I, I just, I, I really believe that we have an obligation and a responsibility to demonstrate and continue to reaffirm every employee. I don't care if they're the bus driver. Bus drivers are so important. But teachers and the people that are, we just talked about, how do you teach 25 different kids in one classroom? It's, it's a tough, it's a really tough task. Um, I, just, I just hope that this board and future boards uh, will, and administrators and people at the district office, and everybody will set that example to show teachers how much we do appreciate and care for them and we're willing to stand up for them and, 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 and do everything we can, provide as many resources as we can to help them find success. Because looking at that number of the graph that you show, showed with the different generations, and we all know because we see in executive session all the LOAs that we're approving, this thing could hit pretty hard. And the idea that there's only 4% or 3% of college graduates going into education. I went to an, um, an AP seminar class last year at Chapin High School, a celebration. They had about 350 kids. One said he was going into education. One of the best and the brightest were going to, decided he was going to go be a teacher. So I just, again, I know I said it. I will say it one more time. We need to do everything we can to show and demonstrate and support our educators and, and all their efforts that they're doing. And thank you. Okay, anyone else? All right, any more questions on 18? Agenda item 18, I just want to make sure. Okay, one more question, okay. So um, this is discussion, so we'll be coming back. Um, I mean, if my math was right, we, we might be able to do more. Is that a consideration? Yes, I, I think it would be a huge consideration. We really, uh, we, what we're trying to, and this is, this is me, um, having cleared this with Marty. I'm also thinking about what options will we have, because this is fund balance that we're gonna be draining to, to do more retention packages um, in the fall. And so um, I think this was a, a way that we could, you know, address this, but um, making sure that we had something in the fall as well. So just to clarify, you said fund balance, but really this is money that wouldn't in get month. into, it's in it, this year's operating year. budget. So if we spend it, it wouldn't make it into the fund balance. That's correct. Or not all of it. That's, that's okay. exactly correct. Okay, just But make because sure. it's a movement, it's a line item movement, right. you have to approve okay. it. Yeah. That was the quickest Dr. Ross jumped all night when you suggested that, just so you know. Like he, I felt the table move. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay, so that moves us to item 19, which is the discussion of potential bond referendum projects and estimates. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ross, but I am going to just say for the board, um, we've had some emails back and forth about a board workshop, um, like an additional board workshop to talk about this um, Again, because it's really important, uh, we've sent, I've sent uh, Amy some dates. I'm waiting on confirmation to, so that we have several different dates, and we'll send out a doodle poll to the board. Um, I know we've sent emails, but I just kind of want to make sure that the public knows that we're planning on having a workshop. We'll probably make it like a hybrid situation where, you know, some board members may join virtually, 
It'll probably be at the district office. We're trying to have it before the April 22nd meeting, but we'll send out a doodle poll with a bunch of dates. I mean, there's only so many dates. Everything is going fast. I just wanted to let you know that we're just, I'm just waiting on that information and we'll send something out um, so that everybody knows that there's more conversations coming. Okay, Dr. Ross. Thank you so much. And uh, I'll move it, uh, through this. I know there will be an opportunity for us to go in depth at, at, at our, our workshop. Um, our timeline is uh, talking about the fix and feel without requiring a tax rate increase plan. Um, we are still talking about the projects of fixing. Uh, by April 22nd, we would have had our community meeting, uh, which is on April the 11th, uh, where we'll give uh, all of the feedback that we're taking into uh, our uh, into consideration to bring back on the 22nd. Uh, so. Uh, we're talking about the fixed part, which is uh, the $240 million. and then on April 22nd, we'll present um, the feedback from the feedback we have from our community, re, a new rezoning maps. Um, and again, um, when we did the facilities conditions assessment uh, that was uh, presented, we talked about the, the total incidences that we have from NPS, um, and so this has gone into uh, the projects that uh, we're putting together. Uh, just kind of piggybacking on our earlier discussion about um, vestibules and, <laughs> and cameras. I have to slow down this there. You see here, we have, uh, after your feedback, we've itemized out where these new vestibules are going to not be confused with the old vestibules that were in the Capitol. Um, and so that you can see how um, in, in that uh, we have articulated this out. Uh, you see our priority uh, for uh, Dutch Fork Elementary School, which would vacate the existing Dutch Fork Elementary School to be converted into Rich Lex. Uh, all of the two rated facilities uh, that had a composite of two uh, would be through the renovations and reconditioning. Uh, the enclosing of walls at Harvest and West and Nursery Road, uh, as well as the elementary school wings at Chapin Elementary and Lake Murray Elementary. Then you see our instructional programs, the Digital Solutions, Small Business Incubator, uh, the, the district office and the professional development building, the construction, develop, uh, workforce development lab, fine arts center, and climate control uh, practice facilities. Uh, when we talk about the security uh, vestibules, we're taking some of them out of uh, this year's capital, uh, but the lion's share of what we've identified at those sites would be um, uh, in the proposed bond referendum. You notice that the new Dutch Fork Elementary has uh, two, uh, the old Dutch Fork Elementary or the Rich Lex building would have two sites because students would be entering through two different areas the adult ed and the uh, academy for success. Uh, the adult, uh, Dutch Fork Elementary, we've seen the uh, property easement there. We've talked about the road and its impact on Dutch Fork um, Elementary School. Uh, we are working closely with the, with the architects of this uh, project in terms of the impacts that will be uh, from the Broad River Road widening program. Um, uh, this is a, a conceptual that would be of the, the new Dutch Fork Elementary School uh, that uh, will allow us to have more uh, of, a, of a better space uh, to educate our children uh, with the, the layout um, that is consistent with Oak Point. You can stand in one area and see through uh, all of the holes. Uh, the facilities condition assessment ratings looks at the composite of the score twos uh, to make sure that we can bring them uh, uh, online to be um, in the area of a, of a four. Uh, in terms of our um, instructional programs, we've talked about the, uh, the STEM program at Dutch Fork uh, High School and uh, bringing that on to a 2.0 with digital solutions and artificial intelligence, which is currently being developed by the, uh, the South Carolina Department of Education. Uh, we've talked about the Construction Workforce Development Lab. Uh, this uh, is a conceptual that we got for free. 
uh, from our own uh, Alan Knotts and his work in, in CAD drawing. So uh, while this is a conceptual, um, it's just kind of showing what we would, we would um, uh, place on that site. But I think what's most important is our objective is to offer uh, construction-related offerings um, for uh, uh, equipment operators, surveyors, mechanics, brick masons, uh, site safety managers, and, uh, et cetera. Um, just earlier in the grading presentation, we were talking about what are some different classes or different skinnies or, or, or four by fours. Uh, this is, is part of that line of getting hands-on uh, work for our students who, who may struggle in the traditional uh, instructional setting. Uh, when we go to Harbison West or Nursery Road, uh, they have very interesting pod setups uh, where there are no walls um, uh, between the classrooms. Uh, to see what that would look like is to look at the current Lee Park uh, setup or even Chapin Elementary um, where it's the same building layout. Uh, we're just going through and, and putting the walls there. Uh, that would um, also involve the HVAC and certain fire suppression systems as well. Uh, the district office, um, as you know, one of the uh, two rated facilities as well, part of that uh, area that uh, we currently don't use as well as the portables, uh, using the land that we already own uh, on the ball field to put the administrative and professional development uh, building. This is a conceptual of what that facility would look like. At uh, Chapin High School, this is the um, area we call the gap uh, between the, the math building or the administrative, uh, the academic building and uh, what is, uh, had those small writings of Fine Arts Center and to uh, insert in that gap uh, the Fine Arts Center uh, Auditorium. So this is a conceptual uh, of what that facility uh, uh, would look like. And then um, we had some feedback uh, uh, specifically as we talked about rezoning, about uh, options. Instead of building a new school in Chapin, uh, expanding on the Lake Marine Elementary um, in Chapin Elementary. And so uh, our goal was to add uh, 20,000 square feet to Lake Murray, thus bringing uh, additional capacity to that school, but understanding too that this includes the portables on site. So with this, we would bring all students back into the building uh, to remove the portables. Uh, same plan at Chapin Elementary School. That's 16,000 square feet uh, and with this, it would allow us to uh, remove, uh, while we increase capacity, that includes bringing all of the students into uh, the building uh, from the portables. Uh, the last one is, uh, do we need a climate control practice facilities? This is questions that uh, I have received. I know you, you have received these questions too. And I met with uh, our athletic directors and our athletic trainers and just wanted to share uh, our conversations um, and I think at the with your permission we would like to invite them at a workshop to just talk about uh, their research and what their findings are. Heat acclimatization uh, challenges are, are being presented to us and this is uh, sometimes we think solely about football uh, but we also have to think about all outdoor sports including band uh, anyone who is, is going to be outside. Uh, Matt Harvey, who is uh, our, our expert on, uh, in the district on these matters, uh, talks about the 15 days that he and his fellow athletic trainers need in order to heat acclimatize uh, the, 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 the students. Uh, our goal is to be outside in, in a condition of wet ball glow uh, temperature of um, of green, that's under 82. Uh, we make provisions um, when it's uh, over 82 through uh, almost uh, 86.9. Um, however, when we start getting to the orange, the red, and the black, um, these present uh, much more challenges. We look at Dutch Fork High School alone, just the readings that Mac Harvey took. Uh, from May 16th to September 14th of this year, 
Um, again, our goal was to stay in, in the green, uh, but make provisions if we're in the yellow. Um, the, the amount of the duration that he took was 121 days. So that's, that's every day between that, the, that, that time period. 31 days are impacted um, over, uh, over yellow. 14 days in the orange peak, uh, nine days of, of red, and, and eight days in the black. That's 26% of the days are impacted um, by, by this heat. Uh, my challenge and reason I br uh, bring this is I think over time, over the next five years, 10 years, it's not going to be 26 days impacted by heat. It's going to be, it's going to grow. Could it grow to 30, 32 percent, 40 percent? We don't know, but I know it will increase. And so providing an opportunity for our facilities to, uh, to be used to properly heat, acclimatize our students. Their recommendation is a uh, climate control practice facility, uh, the pavilion style, which is different from the conceptuals that I showed earlier. Um, and uh, I wanted to add this. Um, um, it's, it's considerably, it's not considerably cheaper, but it, it is less expensive than a full indoor. Um, I would like for them at the workshop to come and explain uh, why they would recommend uh, uh, this type of facility. Uh, but the goal would be uh, to bring the wet bulb um, uh, temperature down enough where the students can safely practice. Uh, there's going to be a lot of questions uh, that, that they can answer, and I don't want to uh, do a disservice to them. But in my questioning to them, I said, look, I've been in the pavilion in the summer. It doesn't seem that much cooler. Uh, but uh, as they explain the design to um, not only bring uh, out of the sun and direct sun, but also create a wind tunnel effect, uh, which would keep the students um, uh, properly heat acclimatized. The goal, I think, and one of the challenges that we have is that students spend more time indoors in air conditioning, going outside and being safe in the, in the heat uh, does take that 15-day heat acclimatization time. So I wanted to spend a little bit more time on this today, uh, knowing that we would bring experts in uh, for, the, uh, for uh, the, the workshop to, to be able to answer uh, more of those questions. Uh, but again, that's the proposal that we, we've set forth, um, and, and these represent our price uh, estimates, our cost estimates for the projects. Uh, totaling uh, $239.7 uh, uh, million. And I stand for any questions. Any questions? Mr. Hogan. Um, Dr. Ross, with the, uh, the screen you've got up for the proposed referendum projects, just to, to make sure I'm 100% clear, this is in prioritized order of the most important where we're starting, if the referendum's to pass, do we have numbers one through, what, 14, 13, however many there are? Um, as to the first project we'll tackle, the second project, the third project, so on and so on. Yeah, yeah. so currently right now we don't have a phasing of the, of the 240, but what we put in list of order, these are the, the, the must have out the door to make the whole plan work. And one of the things that we're going to be talking about uh, in, Feb in, um, in April 22nd is how those that are right out the door uh, at the top, that has a lot to do with how we move our, our students and staff for rezoning. So that's why they're, they're put to the top. I would say that I, I would kind of piggybacking on Mr. Hogan's question or comment. Um, I think like one of the big issues with the bond referendum is is making sure that there is a priority and that you can't jump around and that when we look at this, I mean, I was kind of under the assumption the same that, I mean, for the most part, like this would be like kind of done in order so that you can't, so that like the big pressing issues, ongoing issues are definitely addressed before a new issue that was presented to the board, you know, a couple of months ago. Um, so I, I would, 
I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm kind of, uh, that kind of throws me that it's not necessary. Are you saying that that's not the case? Uh, and, and I'll go back to what, what we have said last week. I think I think I had num number one through seven. Mm -hmm. Or now it's six now, right? Are the number one, That's those are the things that we need to accomplish first. I do want to be uh, clear, though. It's, um, do I think the, the, the first thing we do is build a new auditorium or cl climate control facility? No, I'm not. That, that's not it, but once you pass a referendum, um, it's my understanding you've promised that community these projects. So I think once we get to the point of phasing, we need to make sure that we have a, an adequate phasing process to be able to address these um, because time is of the essence. And so I think the, the first things that have to get phased out are the first six bullets that are listed here. So, um, awesome. Franny Heiser has just raised her hand. Ms. Heiser, are you there? Hello there. I think you're on mute. Hold on. Can you hear us? I can't hear you. Hold on. We're, I think we're working on the technical difficulties. Thank you for your patience. Okay, so they're saying they're on. Can you hear us? Can you? She's not on. She can hear us, but we can't hear her. It's not saying mute on her mic. Yeah, it's not saying mute. <laughs> we can't hear you. Is your microphone on? Or is the volume turned up? I'm saying out some of the te tech support over here. <laughs> Ms. Hines, while they figure that out, I have a question for Mr. Glover, and maybe we'll see if he can get on, if he's still there. Mr. Glover, are you there? I'm here. Can y'all hear me? We can hear you. Can I ask him a question yeah. while they figure? Yes. Um, I wanted to find out um, how much 8% money will we have left over after the $15 million that we just approved for this summer? Uh, that's question one. And question two is how much will we have left over when Irmo High School, is the wing, is paid off? And when will that be? So let me pull up my model real quick while I help to address those questions. Just bear with me for one second. Jay, while you pull that up, we're going to we're going to pull uh, Miss Heiser here on the phone. So um, we're going to get an echo. Does that help? Yeah. Nope. Is that not working? I'm going to walk away and see if it... No. Let, let me text my comment to, to Marty. No. Okay. All right. She's texting. Um, Mr. Glover, do you have it pulled up? Yes. Okay. Just me one second here. Why are we all waiting? I think one of the reasons that I think we, we can go back and look at the, we won't get 240 million all on day one. So we're gonna have different tranches of, of, of funds. So as those funds come out, we wanna make sure that first tranche that we issue those, those bonds for 
hit these critical uh, areas at the top there. Um, but I do think, you know, we owe it to, you know, a full phasing of that, you know, for, for, for the amount. But I, I do want to just kind of make that point. But we'll wait till Ms. Hauser. Um, Franny texted me her comment. She said the phasing would come as part of the education process. I would not recommend putting the order as part of the question. So what I'm understanding from this, um, Franny, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're not recommending that we put the projects in order on the question um, based on the priority. Am I saying this correctly? See, I, I kind of feel like, I mean, I don't know what everybody else feels like, but I mean, if you can just haphazardly pick what can be done on the list, then you get yourself into trouble. And I mean, you saying that we're going to address this first six items, I mean, I want to make sure that the voters know, like when we put something on a ballot, like what we intend to do with the money in, I mean, because I guess it's hard for me to, I mean, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make people mad, but you know, these new programs or new things that were added are not the existing issues that just haven't been dealt with for decades. And I feel like, you know, if you just can, depending on which way the wind swings on the board or in, with district staff or whatever, that you can just change it whenever. I guess that's where I'm, I'm kind of uh, struggling. I feel like we need, if we're going to submit something to the public, we need to have it as concise as we possibly can for them to make a decision because it may impact a decision. Ms. Hines, I think um, completely not my area, but some things that we would, that may impact costs, for instance, if we have a crew that is at and I'm just going to pick a random, this is not real life, I'm just picking an example. If we have a crew at Irmo Elementary that is doing work and we have additional projects at Ir Irmo Elementary that they may be able to work on as well, it may cost us less because we don't have to mobilize twice, whereas that priority for that second piece may not be as high as something else. Does that make sense? It may be more cost effective. So that makes sense, but if you have, if you're doing work on Armo Elementary and then you want to build like a brand new construction thing at the Kate Center, I mean, what if that happens? That, because that's somebody, you know, that is important to, some, you know, I don't know. I mean, I'm just, I'm, at, I'm throwing out things on a whim, but that that's the kind of, I mean, I guess I want to know that the top six are Ms. going to get done in the bond. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ms. Let me ask you a question, because I, I had the same sort of question uh, earlier. Um, I guess now that I'm thinking about it, though, would a, a prioritized list cause any dissension with some folks? And some folks said, well, I don't understand why the fine arts center was number 10, and we were supposed to get that before, because the people in Chapin are going to be very concerned I'm just thinking about what the renovation with the right. press box, how. No, I totally understand. I mean, and that's, that's one of the things that, you know, when we talked about doing a bond resolution before and it didn't go through, I mean, one of the things was because it kept, like, one of the reasons I feel like it didn't, the, didn't have board support was because the items kept shifting in priority and kept changing on what they were. And you didn't really know, like, what you were asking for, like, what you want the voters to vote on. Um, so I think that it's important. I, mean, I think that's why it's important. I mean. I understand what I, you're saying. I, I, so, I, I understand and it would be more defining, I think, for voters. But I guess looking at the list and sort of walking through this whole thing, is Harvest and West more important, a higher priority than nursery roads issues? I mean, you could, if you, if you had a, a, a grouping maybe of things that you know were really pressing issues. Well, and maybe that's what, what it is. It's the top six, like, are going to happen. We're going to focus on those and then come into a, a different phase where we go. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I mean, yeah. I'm thinking out loud, but, I mean, that's a, um, a concern I have. Mr. Scully. Yeah, I, I guess I... I come at it from the opposite viewpoint. I think the more flexibility you can write into it, the better it serves the district. Um, 
for the reasons that um, Ms. Rawls said and also because if you prioritize it in a fixed plan, you can't get to seven until you do number six. And what if the costs blow up on number six to where we can't fund that project? Then it stops everything in its tracks because we can't go further. Um, and just writing regulation, you, you want to write as much flexibility into it because there's so much that you don't, that we can't think of and that we won't be able to iron out now. I understand your point about um, cause dissension and, and confusion, but that's a political thing and that's always going to be there whether we prioritize it and, and nominate each number of the projects. We need to to make it the easiest as possible for us to get all, all of our projects done. So I think with the bond, we, we identify what we want to do, what the bond is for holistically. And the order that, yeah, I, I'm sure, and you know, my question on the climate control practice facilities, it, it's a f impacting 31 days out of the year well, you know, I, yeah, I, I hope that we would build the school buildings first. Um, if it's economical to do that, great. Over, my, my overall question would be, is that even appropriate for the bond referendum versus 8% allocation um, for that type of project? But we need as much flexibility as possible in the referendum so that we can have our best chance to get everything done and not handcuff ourselves unintentionally. I don't know. I think that it's a slippery slope. I, I respectfully disagree. I think that, you know, it's not like a political thing. It is, we haven't had a bond referendum since 2008. There's obviously a lack of trust in the community. Um, we're trying to be as, you know, I mean, the, the, the reality is, is we have very important needs. And some of these items on here, I mean, if we're not going to prioritize, I would just take them off so that they're not even like, you know, there isn't somebody that, or there isn't a situation where we decide we need only one practice facility instead of three. Or, you know, I mean, I just, I don't know. It makes me uncomfortable. And I feel like in the last, the last bond, there's so many questions about projects that now I feel like we need to, we just need to be cognizant of that. Um, Hold on one second, Franny Heiser, and then I'll come back to you. Um, so Ms. Heiser has stated that, um, similar to what Mr. Scully said, that if something were delayed, it would delay all the projects. And then she said that she would work on some language that might be acceptable to the board, and she understands the concerns and will assist in coming up with a solution. I think language would help, uh, definitely. I mean, to, I mean, even if you had to combine some of the items that they're related, but some of these items are not related at all. Kathy? Um, I, I agree that it, that it would be nice to have them prioritized, but the reality is it doesn't, we can do that, and there's no reason people can't change it, and there's no repercussions. In 2008, there was a new elementary school on there, and there was not, a, a, I think it was a field house at one high school and an auditorium at another, and the things that weren't on there got built, and the new elementary school did not get built, even though in the wording, that was on the bond referendum. So I agree with you, but the reality is, it doesn't matter what we put on there, it doesn't have to be built. So I'd almost go the other direction, and just be straight with the voters and just say, we want $239.6 million to do whatever we think is best. And I mean, that sounds bad, but at least be honest with them. Don't put a list out there that can be changed without any repercussions at all. Mr. Glover has raised his hand. Yeah, I just wanted to circle back to the question that was asked about the 8% debt limit, if it's appropriate at this time. That's fine. Yeah, so including the $15 million that was just approved uh, previously in this meeting, uh, the district will have approximately $31 million worth of 8% debt outstanding. And that's up against the debt limit of, let's just say, about $50 million uh, in terms of your total 8% capacity. Um, of that, about $20 million will be paid off on 3-1 of 2025. So that would be the 15 million you just approved, plus about you know, 5 million 
of the prior IRMO bonds that were issued in 2022. So when we sit here at this time next year, you'll have about $10 million worth of 8% debt outstanding and thus about $40 million worth of capacity under your 8% debt limit. Obviously, there's also the limit in terms of your millage to pay debt service, but that's strictly your 8% debt limit. So 31 million as we sit here today, once we pay off what's going to be paid off uh, next year or 31 of 2025, it'd be about $10 million outstanding. That's that 10 million more on top of the 31 or 10 million or only 10 million? Only 10 million. Only, only 10, 10 million, million would be outstanding after you make your 3-1 or March 1, 2025 payments, which would include the $15 million you just approved earlier today, plus uh, $5.6 million of your 2022 bonds that also mature 3-1 of 2025. So you're going to pay off about $20.6 million worth of 8% debt next year. Mr. Hogan? Um, Mr. Glover, with that, is that taking into consideration the uh, the reassessment that's going to happen in 24 or 5 this year? Yeah, that, that does not take into account the reassessment. I'm, I'm using about a $50 million figure in terms of your 8% debt limit. I think that was around 48 or $49 million last year. So that obviously will go up, you know, depending on what the reassessment looks like. Got it. And, and would that be proportionate? Like if our assessment took a 10% assessment, could we equally say there's a 10% increase in 8% capacity? Yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's, I think that's a good equation, yes. A little more difficult than that easy yeah, math. Yeah, I mean, maybe not principle. quite that straightforward, but I think it's a good close estimate. Okay. Anyone else? Have anything for the purposes of tonight's discussion? Thank you, Ms. Heiser and um, Mr. Glover, for staying on so late and jumping in on this conversation. We appreciate it. Um, anything else, Dr. Ross? We're good. Okay, so we're going to continue this conversation at a board workshop and on our next meeting on April 22nd. Um, we'll have you know. There's, lot, there's lots of conversations happening about this, and uh, hold on, Mr. Hogan, do you have something? I'd like to make a motion that we leave, adjourn, excuse me. <laughs> have a second, Ms. Snipes, I get any discussion? All in favor? Ms. Barnhart? Yay. Okay, <laughs> motion to adjourn 7-0, we'll adjourn. <laughs>